Hello, this is a quick video just to give you an overview of the uses of infrared spectroscopy for the OCR A-level course. So starting off, infrared itself is um, perhaps more commonly known to us as heat. And if we go back to key stage three, you should all be aware that if you are to heat up a substance that to, to irradiate it with infrared radiation that this will have an effect on it. Uh, right back in year 7 you would have learned that if you had a cold solid and you apply some infrared you would end up with a hot solid and thanks to my amazing artwork here what you can tell is that these particles are all vibrating. So hopefully you do all remember the idea that infrared has an effect upon chemical substances. What we're going to do now is take that idea just a little bit further and in reality, when we go from this cold solid to this hot solid, this vibration is actually happening to do with the bonds. So here is my lovely diatomic molecule. And you can see here that the atoms can vibrate back and forwards. And what this is known as is stretching. And here, if we have this portion of a molecule, we could end up with the atom on the left kind of vibrating back and forth like that. And the one on the right could also vibrate back and forth. This will have an impact on the bond angle here, which will get greater and smaller. And we call this bending. Now, technically, it's not the each individual mo bond that's bending. It's the molecule. But the bonds absorb infrared radiation, and it causes them to stretch or to bend. And that's taking this idea we've known for a long time and just integrating it to the material that we've been covering as part of A-level. Okay, next thing to consider, each bond has a different bond energy. You've covered that in the enthalpy topics, so you should all be aware of it. And this corresponds to a given frequency. So you do not need to know this equation. Physicists, I hope, are aware of it, but this H is Planck's constant, so the energy is proportional to the frequency. The stronger the bond, the higher the frequency. So um, if this bond was HH, then it would be a different energy to an FF, and it would absorb a different frequency of infrared to cause this stretching to happen. Now, just a quick note, this bit definitely doesn't have to be learned, but you're not going to get the tables and the spectra showing frequency. Instead, they're going to refer to something called wave number. Now I'm just going to show you a couple of quick equations just to hopefully settle you. Wave number, which is given this symbol here, is simply the reciprocal of wavelength. So the units are centimeters to the minus one, or if we think about it, one over centimeters. Now hopefully you all know from GCSE that frequency um, would be the speed of light divided by the wavelength. If wave number is 1 over wavelength, then frequency is speed of light times by 1 over the wavelength, so we can simply replace it here. This is a constant, so it's just a long way of saying that the frequency is proportional to the wave number. So they're going to use wave number, but you can relate that directly to frequency and therefore to energy. Okay. So what are the actual spectra that we're going to see? Well, they will have along the x-axis wave number, which we've just discussed, and the y-axis is going to be transmittance. And the units on here are percentage, with 100 up at the top, 0, and they'll put 50. And what happens is that your sample is placed in a machine, which will uh, emit a whole range of different frequencies of infrared radiation. And if you put nothing in there, then it would be a straight line at 100%, where if you just had it going through a vacuum, nothing would be absorbed. But we're not going to do that. We're going to put a sample in place. And for most of the actual questions to do with the spectra, you're going to be looking at this portion here, between 4000 and 1500. Yes, it is, in fact, getting smaller as you go from left to right. The bit to the right, or to lower than 1,500, we are mostly not going to need. 
because it will have quite a lot of peaks. So instead of being a straight line across, you'll get peaks that will have a variety of lengths and steepnesses and all sorts of things. And it will look really jagged. And this is what's called the fingerprint region. And just like your fingerprints are unique to you, it is unique to any given molecule. And so what this can be used for is to identify a known chemical. You would run the infrared spectrum and then the hopefully you'd have a computer to measure the various uh, peaks and then you would compare it to a reference or to a database. So that is one of the questions that you might be asked. It's a use of infrared spectra and it would be about the fingerprint region the infrared is unique to each molecule and so you can compare to a database. Key bit I'm going to go on to just here. Molecules absorb. So they absorb the frequencies that affect their bonds. So for this molecule that I've started drawing here, it doesn't go along at 100%, but you can see each of these points would link to one or other of their bonds. The main use for us is to know that these peaks will identify the bonds and therefore the bonds will identify the functional groups and there are all of the wave number ranges for each type of bond and their group they're given to you in the data sheet that you get as part of your exam so you do not need to learn these numbers but you need to learn how to use them so what I'm going to do is try and show you what one might look like. There is a key peak here that will occur somewhere between 1630 and 1820. So on my awesome graph here, there is one sharp peak at that range there. And so if you ever see a peak in this range, it belongs to the carbonyl group, the carbon-oxygen double bond. And by location, that means it could be a ketone or an aldehyde, or in fact any molecule with a C double bond O. So it could be a carboxylic acid, an ester, it could be an amide, it could be acyl chloride, acid and hydride, it could be any of those. So right now that helps us, but it hasn't fully identified which molecule I'm drawing for you up here. So before I go any further, there is a peak at 2850 to 3100 so somewhere around the 3,000, that every single molecule will have, which is the CH, and that's basically any alkyl, or even any alkene, or even any of the aromatic groups. So basically anywhere there's a carbon-hydrogen, you're going to get a peak there. That's one that's just going to be ignored when it comes to identifying our functional groups. So there are two main bonds that we're looking out for. The first is the carbon double bond to oxygen, and the second is the oxygen to hydrogen. However, it occurs in two different places, sorry, two different ranges, depending if it's in an alcohol or a carboxylic acid. If we have a carboxylic acid, this OH is going to produce a very broad and slightly lower in number peak. So I'm going to show you one up here. The CH bond peak is kind of in the middle of it, but basically it will look something like that. And then they've got this peak hidden into the middle of it. So this tells me that there's an OH, this tells me there's a carbon double bond oxygen and that's the CH. And the range of this would make me confident that it's a carboxylic acid and not an alcohol. So I could say that this molecule here is a carboxylic acid and that's basically the way we will use these. Uh, thank you all.